Welcome, YouTube community, to my page, The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Today's guest, as I mentioned in last week's episode, is a tremendous honor of a lifetime, and I can't think of a better fitting guest. I'm going to be bringing on Elizabeth Boisson, the president and one of the founders of Helping Parents Heal. And Elizabeth is going to talk a little bit about Helping Parents Heal and her mission in this life, her incredible influence on thousands of souls. And I personally have been a fortunate guest on HPH on several times, and I could tell you just how impactful and heart-centered it is. You know, I've been thinking for quite some time who would be my first guest to bring on the wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, and I couldn't think of a better fit than Elizabeth. She personifies all things that the Wisdom Jacob's Ladder is about. She comes from the heart. She's there for a mission. And she's a beautiful Aries, inside and outside. And Aries is the perfect sign to break ground. And I couldn't think of a better person who's here to break ground as my first ever interview of hopefully many, but someone who personifies the high vibrational Aries spirit that has turned death or decay into awareness of the infinite life. And Aries is that first sign of the zodiac, and she personifies that, and she's called to action, she's called to a purpose. And we are all so lucky to know this incredible earth angel who I could call my friend. And Elizabeth and I have kind of been joking around because we just when we talk on the phone, it's like for almost two hours, and I never talk with anyone for over 10 minutes. Without further ado, I'd love to welcome you, the president of Helping Parents Heal, and the author who compiled Life to Afterlife, a wonderful book gathered by stories by shining parents, Elizabeth Boisson. Thank you for being my first guest here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jacob. And that was such a beautiful introduction. I truly appreciate it. And I am so grateful that you have been a guest on Helping Parents Heal. You have so much wisdom to, to spread to everyone, um, especially those people who have experienced the passing of a child or a loved one. And um, it is really... Uh, wonderful that near-death experiencers are able to tell us what has happened when they've transitioned and then been, been able to come back and tell us that our kids in spirit and that all of our loved ones in spirit are so much better than we are here. They are so happy, healthy, and whole. And um, this is this is our school. This is our earth school. So um, I feel very grateful um, to have understood this almost immediately um, when my second child transitioned. And um, I talking about Mor Morgan's passing. Yeah, about yeah. Morgan's transition. Yeah. And um, so thank you for having me on, and I'm excited to speak to you today. It's It's of great honor and inspiration. I often say to myself that people have terms for near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, shared-death experiences, and something that I know you spoke about that you had with Morgan, the shared-death experience. But to me, they're all one and the same. They're categorized, but they basically were on a certain ground in our life and we're getting you know, comfortable to agree, but then there's these shake-up periods that kind of causes us to fo to look at life in a new way. And certainly with the thousands of bereaved, you know, individuals and parents, you know, I find looking at the finite reality and re and reevaluating, you know, maybe that finite passing that someone, that people could remember the infinite and they could remember the eternity of the soul from some of the pain. And I know last week in my episode, I spoke about transitioning pain into purpose and how that's so pivotal in our journey. And I couldn't think of a better guest who has been the living embodiment each and every day of her life, who is able to be that miracle of transformation and not only her inner life, but her outer life. And we're so fortunate 
by your great call to action. I, I wanted to just take a couple steps back and ask you, certainly I know about helping parents heal, and I'll refer to it as HPH because I, just, I love that abbreviation. But for those listeners who you know, might have lost a loved one or know someone who lost a loved one, or maybe they're just curious, what is the essence of HPH? What is it really about? Who's a good fit for it, really? Thank you for asking. Well, it's interesting because um, before Morgan transitioned, I um, I guess that I was kind of a, an agnostic. I was also um, maybe a Buddhist because I'd lived in India for a long time mm. and um, with my parents. And um, then when Morgan transitioned, and this was my second child to transition. My first child, uh, Chelsea, transitioned after only two days in uh, Montpellier in France. But Morgan transitioned at the base camp of Mount Everest, and I had a shared death experience with him. And um, I was able to receive the most incredible hug from Morgan when he transitioned. And I knew at that instant that love lives forever that morgan would always be with me and that our kids who transition our loved ones who transition are are not dead they're actually better than we are they are um happy healthy and whole and i thought that probably every parent who was experiencing this um the transition of a child was also having this kind of shared death experience. I realize now that it's fairly rare and I understand why. And I think that the fact that my daughter had transitioned um, before Morgan made my whole, um, everything about me much more ready to understand this other um, aspect of our lives, which is so important. And that is that we don't die. And I truly believe that this is something that um, and that everything that we do here on Earth um, is all about it should be all about love. Um, that's the reason that we're here. And so um, Helping Parents Heal was was started a week after Morgan transitioned at the base camp of Mount Everest. And um, I did so just to meet other parents who have children who have trans transitioned. And I wanted to talk to them about um, what, it, what I had experienced and see if they were experiencing the same thing. And not only did I have this shared death experience with Morgan, but I started getting incredible signs from him. And um, I, I spoke to lots of different parents here in the area that I, that I live in, but I was also lucky because I had just gotten onto Facebook. And the reason that I was on Facebook was because Morgan had moved to China to study abroad mm. and he told me, mom, you better get onto Facebook because I don't take pictures, but lots of my friends do. So if you want to see any pictures of me while I'm in China, um, get onto Facebook and you can see my profile. And um, it turned out that it was it was wonderful to be on Facebook at that time because I was able to reach out to other parents all over the United States and even the world um, to see how they were coping with the passing of their child, but also to see if they were having the signs and synchronicities and um, maybe even shared death experiences that I had experienced myself. Wow, you know, that is a fascinating transformation. You know, I've heard, you know, other organizations speak to this where grief doesn't have to be so morose, if you will, you know, that, you know, and many times, you know, as, certainly as a therapist, when we really 
have like let's say a grief group or if we have counseling you know it's focused on the passing but there's been other organizations like yours that i've heard that people will just kind of wait in the uh you know parking lot and talk about all these things and so organizations start where we're like why don't we incorporate this after life after life knowing or belief to really work with grief and have a safe space for people to process this because that box and how we view that loved one is so important if we see that loved one under that box and that's all that they are i could see the com you know the comorbidity and just how difficult um the morbidity of it and just how difficult that is versus when you're seeing oh that this person is around me some way that they are beyond this body but not only that i could connect there's a different engagement and more access to them in other ways my my question for you i i guess is you've been able to certainly you know live your life regarding the transformational light but i always say two things could be true at the same time that we could have that spirit that sees this but also the part of us that feels emotions and goes through it and i'm just wondering for you how have you been able or what tools have you been able to kind of utilize to deal with the the pain that you may or may not have felt with Morgan's transition? You know, how could you speak to parents or people who lost loved ones with that regard? That's a very good question. And I think that one of the things that was really helpful to me was that I was practicing yoga when Morgan passed and not just practicing. I had started back when I was in uh, middle school when I lived in India. Um, but I was really practicing. I was planning on becoming a yoga teacher trainer, a uh, teacher. And so I, um, I was practicing at least twice a day. And I think that raising your vibration really helps to, first of all, um, allow us to make our way through grief, but also ultimately connect with our loved ones in the spirit. And it's interesting because um, I also, at that time, dropped yoga and wanted to climb to the top of every mountain in my area. So, of course, Morgan passed at the base camp of Mount Everest. It really drove me to want to get up high to see if I could connect with him better. And I think that that is a very good way. Um, we talk about thin places um, in the afterlife community, about the places that it's where it's easiest to be able to connect with our loved ones in spirit. And I realize now that that was why I was going to these high places. Mm -hmm. And as I hiked, I would, um, uh, I would put one foot down and say sacred, and then I would put the other foot down and I'd say grateful. And I would just hike like that, and it was a moving meditation. And I would always feel connected to Morgan, as well as to Chelsea, my daughter in spirit. Wow. But it's so funny that you talk about um, connecting with people in parking lots. It's true that I did try other uh, bereavement support groups right. and we don't really like the word bereaved parents and helping parents heal. We call ourselves shining light parents because we believe that the light of our kids shines through us. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of times I was told that we weren't allowed to speak about the signs and synchronicities that our kids were sending us. So um, I would be approached by, by people in the parking lot and they'd say, tell me about the signs. I'm getting signs from my right. children as well. And, and I think that we all do. I think that um, when we're open to it, um, every, every parent gets tons of signs from their kids. A lot of times, because of the grief, you're a little bit shut down and you're not able to um, understand or, mm. or recognize those signs. But um, 
once you start realizing that they are, that they love connecting with us as much as we love connecting with them, the signs just never stop coming, which is really wonderful. But hmm. going back to your question about helping parents heal, um, we're different from other uh, support groups because we truly believe in a connection with our children on the other side. And um, we also uh, believe that it's very important to talk about how our children lived and not necessarily about how they passed because um, how they passed is just a blip in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of things of their incredible lives. And so um, certainly it's not something that we don't speak about, but mm -hmm. we do believe that any way of transition, whether it be by a car accident, by suicide, by drug use, by um, cancer or any type of disease, anything that leads to a transition is exactly the same. The kids end up in exactly the same place. And um, it's important for parents to understand that because I think that society puts a lot of stigma on um, different ways of passing. And Morgan told me as soon as he as soon as he came through to a medium, uh, very soon after he transitioned, he told me, Mom, if I hadn't transitioned at the base camp of Mount Everest, I would have transitioned on the I-10 coming from the University of Arizona up wow. to um, Phoenix and in a car accident. And that is an incredibly uh, dangerous road. So I know that we have a lot of different exit points that are possible. And I think that our soul ch chooses the right exit point based on what the, what that, what the lesson, what the important thing in this life um, we're supposed to learn. So um, I believe that Morgan transitioned at the base camp of Mount Everest when he did, and that Chelsea had tra transitioned before she did because I was supposed to start helping parents heal right away. Wow. And all of this is a very unique perspective. You know, I think sometimes we could say that life, you know, happens to me, you know, but but really it's like life happens through me. And sometimes when parents, I don't know if you experience this, but parents have a child, will just kind of like have possessiveness, like that is mine, my, you know, kind of thing. But really, yes, we are connected, but this is a child here from the spirit realm coming through our physical bodies. And this is not just a child. And certainly having a near-death experience at a very young age, I could tell you, we experience ourselves through our bodies, but that's not the full totality. So I'm wondering if this perspective has helped, you know, really parents kind of allowing their kids to have an afterlife, but being able to really find life after their, you know, death or passing. I think that's really the crux of what you're about is to make peace between both. I truly believe that it makes everyone understand that this isn't it and this this world is is pretty dense and difficult at times and it's okay uh, what we need to do is to try to make it as happy and as loving as we can mm -hmm. for everyone around us and to send healing energy to everyone that we care about but i also think that parents frequently when they find out that their kids are still here and they receive signs from their children and if they have a reading with a medium for instance and that medium brings them enormous peace um all of those things are so incredibly healing that they can almost changed someone, someone's life in an instant. And it's so exciting for me to be able to witness that because 
I know that our kids are incredibly strong, that they are working very hard to, um, to heal their parents, but also to change the world. In fact, in the very beginning of this journey, I kept hearing this mantra that um, our children on the other side will change the world. Um, and this is something that is related to the research that Gary Schwartz is doing wow. um, in Tucson with the soul phone. I, I truly believe that our communication with them is allowing um, us to raise our vibration and to understand that the afterlife is real and that, um, and that of course they are happy, healthy and whole, but that we're going to be with them again. Um, it's going to be like the blink of an eye mm. um, living here on earth. And then when we see them again, it'll be as though not one second has passed. So I, I think that being able to understand that, I, I think one of the things that I've felt for quite some time is almost as though Morgan is on an exchange program the way that he was when he transitioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I hear from him to, from, I, from time to time, he sends wow. me and I know that he hears from me all the time. I'm always mm -hmm. telling him how much I love him. Um, but we'll be back together as uh, as soon as we need to be. And yeah. we'll be able to spend time all the time together. And so um, it is very healing to um, understand that and be able to interact with a group of now we're over 25,000 parents throughout the world who all have understood this. <laughs> it is a radical different stance, you know, on loss. And, you know, certainly loss isn't anything new. I really credit the work of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross for really making grief a household concept in some of the stages that could now we now know could be interchangeable. And I know our friend David Kessler really spoke about that sixth stage called meaning and purpose, which I know you and so many others have found, you know, through that, you know, particular passing. I wanted to ask you, I, I saw that you, you know, had this radical different verbiage on a bereaved parent that you used the term Correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's shining light, parent. Right? Is that is that it? Yeah. My two part question is: What kind of made you decide to use a different language? Because there's there's a method to helping parents heal. There's reasons for the intrinsicies, and our words are so important. But you know, how is that different than you know when we look at it as a bereaved parent, and how has that really changed? people and what is you know a shining light parent what does that exactly mean you know for people who have that identity versus a bereaved parent that's an excellent question and i i just want to first say that bereaved is probably one of the saddest words in the dictionary and irene and i were really having a hard time with people on the Facebook group calling themselves a bereaved parent because we don't, we don't feel that way. I've never felt that way. Even maybe even a second after Morgan transition, I wouldn't have called myself bereaved. I would have called myself searching maybe, but not bereaved. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we talked to Suzanne Giesman about it because um, she was, fascinated by this as well. And she is a shining light stepmom. And mm -hmm. so um, she meditated about it. And her guides told her the term shining light parent, which also is the same for a shining light sibling who's had a sibling pass, mm -hmm. shining light aunt or uncle, grandma, uh, grandmother, grandfather, can even be a shining light spouse. But um, we don't have a spouses group in helping parents heal. We just concentrate on children. And so um, 
being able to call ourselves um, differently, I think, really, first of all, raises our vibration, mm -hmm. but it also is so much more descriptive of the way that we are because we're not saying that we are shining brightly because of the fact that we're happy and um we're we're doing well for instance um there are a lot of parents early on in their journey that might not be at that point where they're shining so much that they can actually reach out and help somebody else but um we are shining light parents because the light of our children shines through us and i think that that light can be seen by everyone around us and in fact i would go into stores after morgan transitioned and i'd wonder if people could see morgan around me because i just felt like he was this enormous bright light that was wow. lighting me up and so it's so much more um descriptive and um accurate to call ourselves shining light parents and from from this terminology you know that parents view them because i think there's so much into the power of words you know in belief and how we view ourselves you know have you seen some degree of a transformation with people who now view themselves this way versus like we talked about that more morose label of identity is there a change and a shift that you've seen you know through yourself and others oh of course i i love the term shining light parent i think that everybody does mm -hmm. we have little pins that suzanne geesman had made up that we uh, that we gave out at the conference about shining light parents um and people love to wear them mm -hmm. i think that um it's kind of fun we have t-shirts on our website as well we have a um wow. place that you can purchase merchandise that all goes back to helping parents heal but anyway um with shining light mom or shining light dad on the t-shirt mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of fun to wear a t-shirt like that and have people say, what's a shining light mom? What's a shining light dad? Instead of having someone come up to you and say, I hear that your son or daughter passed. How are you feeling? Um, I think that that for a lot of parents is very difficult, especially in the very beginning, because how is anyone ever feeling when their son or daughter has transitioned it's it's a very very difficult time but being um being a shining light parent you can say i feel my son or i feel my daughter with me every step of the way wow you know i just want to share something that three out of my four grandparents were aries just a fun fact which represents the pioneering element and just getting things started, the patriarchs and matriarchs in my family. But I had a patriarch in my family who was not into this afterlife stuff at all. But he would say something very congruent with what you're saying. He would say, Jakey, I don't believe in this afterlife nonsense, but I live through you. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, he's come through readings and he's like, showing off like where he's at and how like now i get it you know oh, I get but, it. but it's get so it get over there. <laughs> he gets he gets it now but before he's just like i don't want to talk about the woo woo stuff let's talk about sports fine but now he it's it's a very congruent what you were talking about where you know our loved ones carry a light and they're connected to us and i wrote a chapter in the wisdom of jacob's ladder my second book called Our Superpowers, mm -hmm. where sometimes we really aspire to these Marvel characters or these people with great powers, but sometimes we forget how much is inside of us and all around us. And have you been able to notice some parents, you know, shining light parents, not only tap into the afterlife connection with their loved ones, but maybe that's transitioned them to be able to read for others. Has this transformed, you know, people's lives to just connect? Because every medium wants to tell you that 
what I can do, you can do. So have you seen that at all through HPH, you know, people doing this professionally? I see it every day. I, yeah. I, I must say it's pretty amazing. People who would never, ever have thought, first of all, that they could connect with their kids. Then they're starting to connect with their kids and then they start connecting with other kids and then they want to help other parents to be able to hear from their kids as well. So yes, I think that superpowers do come from very difficult life events. And I love that chapter in your book. And I think that it is important for people to understand that through tragedy, some of the most amazing things can happen. And we call it collateral beauty. I love the name from the film uh, with Will Smith. I also think that um, the, the aspect of mediumship is something that everyone is able to do. Everyone is a medium. Wow. Um, I think that kids, when they are born, are probably very, very good at it. We lose a little bit more every day as we're kind of, um, we conform to the way that we're supposed to be. And then when we have a tragic life event happen, um, everything is blown open. And it's so interesting because we have parents who have children transition who talk about the gifts that they actually receive that it's almost as though having their child transition was a gift because it has given so much to them in their lives and they haven't lost their child their child is still here we we say that all of our children in spirit are still right here which is another uh, terminology that's used by Suzanne Giesman. Um, but they, um, they're our biggest cheerleaders. They help us to do what we need to do. And I think that they're most proud of us when we reach a hand back and help another person forward. And that also helps us on our healing path. It's really, really important to understand, as David Kessler says, that the sixth element of grief is that we help other people. And um, we can do that in many different ways by starting a, a nonprofit, by um, serving food in a, um, be, being able to help people who are homeless. Uh, I have so many friends here who have created foundations to be able to even give showers to homeless people and things like that. But, um, but I think that not only uh, are the parents able to become mediums, but they also become caring listeners in our group. And again, reach a hand back and help other parents forward to be able to um, to understand that their kids are still right here. Yes, so in other words, it's very contradictory to our culture, which is really about the more that we take, the more that we have. And really what you're discussing with grief is the more you help, the more you give, the more you have. It's a very interesting phenomenon. The more that we uplift others, the more that we get. And, you know, there's a word in Judaism, and it's sometimes when a word is so strong, I have a hard time saying it in English, but the word is nachas, right? Nachas, joy. So I'm wondering for you, you give so much. Do you ever, like, feel that? Do you ever, like, have that, you know, saying that kind of radiates with you within? I'm wondering if you get that sometimes. I think that all of us do. And in fact, it's hard for us as in many cases, it's hard for parents who have had a child transition, go back to the same friend group that they had before their child transition. I think that a lot of people worry about losing friends after their child transitions because um, their friends are afraid of how to approach us, you know, how, what to say to us. And I think that 
that is something that will naturally happen, that you'll have friends drop off. You might continue to have the same friends, but in many cases, those friends will talk about things that just don't seem important to you anymore. Right. Very and, trivial matters that they yes, discuss. Yes, so they'll talk yeah. about the car that they just bought or the vacation that they just went on or um, other things that for us aren't important anymore. The things that we like to talk about when we get together as Shining Light parents are what the latest signs that our kids sent us and um, talking about other um, things that we've learned about the afterlife. And in fact, um, a documentary was made about helping parents heal by Craig McMahon. And we did a wrap up kind of filming with Suzanne Giesman actually. And she did a reading for all of us and we were all in the audience. And then we had a big dinner and everybody brought something. And Craig was blown away by the fact that everybody's conversation around the table was so real and so interesting. And that we talked about things that he felt to be important. And that's the way we are. And not only that, but when we go to restaurants, it's funny, in before COVID, we used to go to a lot of restaurants and we'd be a huge group around the table and everybody would be laughing. And sometimes people in the restaurant would say, oh, who's that group of people to the to the waiter and the waiter would say oh they've all had a child pass <laughs> and wow. it didn't make sense but being able to be around people who understand and who um who want to hear about your child that's so much that's so much fun to be able to talk about your child and not have the person that you're talking to um just Go, freeze because a lot of times when you're trying to describe about what your son or daughter or whomever it may be in spirit is like mm -hmm. people will be very nervous and they don't they don't know what to say but of course we all know what, what to say to each other so it's perfect so mm -hmm. um it is it's very liberating and freeing to um understand this and to be able to interact with people who also understand yeah. Wow. You know, and for those parents or loved ones sitting at home, you know, it is possible within time. It may not be tomorrow, the next week, the next month, but it is possible to find a beautiful life after a passing and you, in your circle, living embodiments of it. And, you know, I like also what David Kessler discussed where he speaks about grief a lot and how it's kind of like a river. And when you just kind of go with it, it will take you to transform from potential agony, despair, you know, to maybe more beauty and meaning with, within your life. And I think what you're doing is great because you're utilizing a lot of this higher awareness and connection, you know, that's really real. And you're living for your loved ones, living through them. And correct me if I'm wrong, but our loved ones when they pass, they really want us to not only be the undeniable proof of their existence, of what we're about and how we're able to integrate some of what they're about, but to live for them. Because, you know, they're over there, but we're over here and they want us to just laugh at the table, enjoy climbing mountains like you were doing. Like, that's what it's all about. That's, that's beautiful. Well, I think that that's an important point. I also think that when we have our meetings of Helping Parents Heal, especially when they're in person, I actually had a dad who was becoming a medium almost immediately. His son had transitioned by suicide and he was sitting next to me in the meeting and it was one of his first meetings. We'd gone around the, the uh, circle and everyone had spoken. He had spoken first. And then he said, I've just got to tell you something. And he, he tapped me before the end of the meeting. And he said, we have at least 40 kids that are up that I see in front of me right now. Wow. And he said, it looks like there are even more kids than there are parents here. They are all laughing, having fun. And he said, and I just want to tell you that they high five each other every time mm -hmm. that one of the parents smiles. And so I think that that's 
their main objective is to make sure that we're happy. And so I feel like I have to make sure that parents understand that that's what their kids want. They want them to be happy. And um, also, I, I also think that in terms of the, the greater scheme of things, um, my life has changed completely. I right. used to, and I think that this is something that's important for parents to understand. I used to fear death. Um, not as much as some of the parents who used to go in, they always thought they had cancer. They always thought something was happening and um, before their child mm -hmm. transitioned. I think that if you asked anyone in our group, everyone would say, I no longer fear death at all. There, there's no fear whatsoever, which is really a freeing wow. concept. Wow. Why do you think that is, that they don't fear death? Is it what what do you think changed with a lot of these people? Because that is one of the top five fears, you know, that most people have. And we joke like off off air, we joke like how we have exposure therapy to two of the top five fears by doing public speaking and thinking about <laughs> death all day. So but I'm wondering like how does that transformation take place? Like how does that happen? Well, I have to say that um having a child in spirit i think that having a mother or a father or you know grandparents um sister brother is hard um and we do have helping siblings heal but having a child pass before you transition is probably one of the most difficult things that anyone would go through in their lives and so um it leads to trying to find out where your child is and what your child is doing. That's exactly what you want to do immediately is to find out everything that you can. You can't about. accept anything other than knowing that, you know, it's like the and, parent instinctual. Yeah. The mo especially a mother, it's not all losses are the same and not all positions that we have are the same. It's, it's different. But yeah. mother or father, yeah, in fact, yeah. um, I read about 80 books the first year after Morgan transitioned. Wow. My wow. first book, two days after he transitioned, was Life After Life uh, by wow. Dr. Moody. And he became a very good friend. Um, and I I also love the fact that he's the one that, who introduced the concept of the shared death experience as well, which made me feel like I wasn't crazy um, because I had been feeling like something very strange had happened and I didn't understand why all of my friends um, who knew me and knew how much I love Morgan kept saying, you're going to, you're going to be coasting along and then you're just going to plunge down because, um, because you love him so much and one of these days you're going to have to go through this and i kept thinking i don't think so because every time i actually did start to feel like i was going to cry i could feel morgan giving me that hug again mm, he was constantly wow. and i don't think that all parents might experience that this and i think it's good to cry too i definitely don't think people should not be crying but i think that my um task at hand was to continue moving forward pushing forward with helping parents heal letting people know that our kids in spirit are still right here wow that is beautifully said and put you have an interesting background you know you have certainly a lot of experience like you said on an international basis you lived in india you trained in ashrams but also you have this academic side to you. You're a Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill grad and you know, UNC, you know, kind of person. So there's a lot of interesting gears uh to Miss Boisson. I'm wondering for you, do you feel that grief has a part of us that is kind of like taught to us culturally, or there's an anthropological kind of basis of grief? And or is it more so just kind of in us and natural? I'm wondering how much of how we grieve is taught to us versus how much is just 
kind of natural and instinctual nature nurture kind of thing what what would you say to that i think that's yeah. a very very good question and i feel very uh fortunate to have lived in india for s quite some time and in india when uh when someone transitions um the clothes that people wear to a funeral are white mm -hmm. um and when the person is cremated um everyone at that funeral knows that they are going to be reincarnated so um they know that life continues that this is something that is not ending and um i felt while i was in india and i think that the influence of the in, uh, eastern religion um i felt very um very much a part of the eastern traditions i um i know that i've spent past lives there and i think that it did help me enormously when chelsea transitioned and then when morgan transitioned i also think that um that <sighs> some of the people, some of the members that we have in Helping Parents Heal, who are the strongest supporters, and even those who have become mediums, are those who grew up with a very strict kind of fundamentalist, uh, maybe Christian mm. upbringing, but who would come to our meetings over and over again, thinking, what is it that that they're saying that I'm just not getting. And then all of a sudden it clicked mm -hmm. and signs started coming and they um, started actually connecting with their children in spirit. And now they're, they're completely happy because they're, they're communicating with mm -hmm. their kids in spirit. But I always feel like those are some of the greatest success stories because when you have a belief system that's very, very, um, very much a part of you and your family, mm -hmm. and you're able to see beyond that and see that there are things that might be um, more helpful and healing, uh, it's, it's always a wonderful thing for yeah. me to see that. As a therapist, certainly it's very hard to have individuation, meaning we do something a little bit differently than our family. But I think what you do is so essential because there needs to be support with maybe people having individuation past the religious belief systems, cultural and family. So to have that cohesive support, I think is brilliant. And it, I'm sure has led to incredible transformation. It's just so essential because you made a great point that, yes, not all loss are the same, but like one particular loss, for instance, you know, I looked at some research that said that, and again, even our terminology is just so pathologized. We use the term commit when it comes to suicide. You don't commit cancer. You don't commit a heart attack. You know, it is not all just a mental health issue. Some could be physical. I know my grandmother you know, got hit by a car and she just couldn't function. That was her decision, you know? So, but uh, I'm wondering, like, a lot of parents who lose kids, particularly to suicide, statistically, the amount of support from the community is down by like 70% because there's a degree of shame, you know, an embarrassment, you know? And so I, I'm wondering, like, how could people relate from what you've seen to those who have lost kids and, how what exactly from what you gather do people really want when they lose a child what are some things that people want or once what are some things that people don't want i know there's subjectivity to it but some overall tips for others on the other side to handle you know those who have lost loved ones well i think that it's important that people start using language never ever commit because of course it's not a crime it's a um right. we talk about transitioning by suicide, just as we transition by any other um, 
any other method for for instance you know altitude sickness is another way that children transition um i personally believe in a soul plan but not everybody in helping parents heal necessarily does or has to um i believe again in exit points i believe that um whatever way that a child has transitioned it was already decided before they were even born, probably with the mom and dad. Wow. And so, um, I, I think that each way of transitioning is, um, is a way to teach us and to teach those around us something more that's really essential. But I also think that um, it's important that we are non-dogmatic. Um, we don't have a specific belief system and we don't ask people to believe the way that we do. They can, mm. and they can also believe, they can be Catholic, they can be um, evangel uh, Non-dominational approach, they, yeah. Yeah, they can be Jewish, they can be Muslim. We have people from all over the world, Hindu, um, and, it's something that um, you you don't even need to leave your religion at all mm. to be a part of our group. Um, our group is simply a group to allow parents to mm. uh, to help them heal from the passing of a child, but also to connect with their children on the other side through many different methods. So, I mean, what you're saying is basically, you know, their lives can change, but what they're doing, like, they don't have to leave everything behind. This could enhance what they're currently doing. They could leave behind some of those things that, you know, may not be of value. Because you're right. We spoke about a point where you lose someone, you know, it does change you. And you kind of reevaluate the things that matter in life from that chick appeared, from that loss. And you can't be the same. You're changed. but you could why not be better than ever in a way? Why not be improved? I mean, sure, we would love, you know, for things to be different and to have our loved ones back instead. Many parents I hear, you know, say that we'd rather have it the other way, but for the situation, for what it is, we're doing the best that we can through taking these other higher pathways of connecting uh, from the ground up. I, I wanted to ask you something that, um, you know, in another interview I've heard, because I'm a big fanboy of helping parents heal. I listen to all of your, you know, people that you bring in, because I'm a student of this stuff. And I really learn, geez, I'm planking on her name right now for some reason, but she she herself lost a child and she's a shining light parent, but she's an incredible medium. She lives in Arizona. Who am I talking about? Okay, there's Suzanne Wilson. There's no. uh, Lisa Wilcoxon. Lisa Wilcoxon. Okay, that's it. So Lisa was kind of talking a little bit about your life, and it just almost seemed like all of these things that you experienced, you know, from learning in the ashram and your yoga practice, you know, just kind of in a way, there was something more to this. There was something preparing you for this. Like, do you feel guided in doing what you're doing? Do you feel like it's a past life thing? Like, where do you feel this is from? You know. Well, it's definitely a past life thing. And I realize now I did a past life regression actually with Sue Frederick, and it was Reverend Sue Frederick. Well, Reverend, yes. And it was amazing. Um, I, I learned so much more about um, the reasons for what I do. But I also think that um, things have lined up in my life to make it the way that it is. And I feel very grateful. And having Chelsea transition when she did uh, at just two days was, of course, the hardest thing in my life at the time. But Morgan was there. He had been, I had been in the hospital on an IV for two months. Mm -hmm. And um, I missed Morgan because I couldn't be with him um, when Chelsea passed two days after she was born. I got to go home to Morgan and he really saved me. So that whole um, transition of Chelsea in the beginning wasn't at all like the one with Morgan. 
when Morgan transitioned at the base camp of Mount Everest, it was a completely different thing because uh, he was 20, almost 21 at the time. Mm. And um, he had a, an incredibly bright future. He spoke three languages. He had studied abroad in three different places. Um, he was also just so wonderful, giving just an incredible, um, easygoing um, young man. And the light of every room when he would walk into the room. Mm. And, and so, and he was six foot six, um, again, uh, and he had a heart to match. And so it was very difficult um, to receive that call. But to receive the call, um, and I didn't really explain what happened, um, he was undergoing CPR uh, in Tibet, and um, his roommate uh, gave the director his phone number. And so the director gave it to me, and I called Colin, and I said, Colin, um, I know that Morgan is suffering. Um, could you put the phone up? Well, first of all, he said, Miss Boisson, it doesn't look good. <clears throat> We're doing CPR, and I don't think that he's going to make it. He's not breathing, breathing right now. And so when, um, when he said that, I said, okay, Colin, could you put the phone up to his ear? And when he did, I said, we love you, we're proud of you, and don't be afraid. Mm. It was exactly at that moment that I felt him wow. hug me. It was the most incredible hug. And um, another thing that I've heard from a medium since this has happened, actually I've heard it from three separate mediums, is that Chelsea was the first person to meet Morgan on the other side and wow. she gave his hand and led him to me. So I think that I had an advantage over other parents who, um, you know, haven't had two children pass, although that's how would you ever call having two children pass an advantage? But I think that he had this helper on the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, lead him to me, which is just so incredible. Wow. You know, I, I know you mentioned Dr. Rima Moody. I actually spoke to him a couple of days ago. He's a friend oh. of mine. And, you know, I've kind of spoke to him in the past, and he coined the term near-death experiences, as people know. But when he speaks about what you had, something called a shared death experience, he's almost even more blown away because the body is totally intact. There's nothing going on to like induce a potential like halluc nothing. And for you to have what you have is just amazing. And not enough people, I mean, they, they think of you as helping parents and all that stuff, but not a lot of people like highlight this profound shared death experience that you've had. It's, it's amazing. But like, what's your viewpoints on SDEs, in general, like how do you see them kind of fitting in? Like, why do they happen? Like, what is it about really? Yeah. I think that people are now talking about them a lot more than they used to. Mm. And um, we have fortunately had Dr. Christopher Kerr come and speak to our group. Wow. His book, Life is But a Dream, mm. um, talks about um, in a palliative care unit in or his, his on his floor in Buffalo, New York, and he's the head of the uh, palliative care unit. Um, these elderly people who are about to transition, having dreams, uh, they call them dreams, about the afterlife, being with all of the people that they love, um, spending time with them, and, and then coming back again and um they describe them as the, as though they're completely real and so that's one thing that's really exciting um william peters actually wrote about my shared death experience in his new book which came out in last january actually about shared death experiences and uh with the blessing of dr raymond moody he worked with him but it's very interesting because when I finally 
figured out that this was a shared death experience. And I figured it out from speaking to mm. Dr. Moody, to Raymond, he's such a sweet person. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Online, and I wanted to see as much information as possible about it. And it was so fascinating because the first interview that I found about a shared death experience was of Raymond Moody when he was in California and he was in the woods, he was being interviewed. And I looked at the date on the interview itself and the date was October 20th, 2009. Wow. Morgan transitioned in, in uh, Tibet on October 20th, 2009. So, oh my God. So much, actually I just got Goosebumps again when that's I a said. chill. That's a definite chills moment. Just the synchronicity. You just can't make this. What are the chances of same exact date, same exact year in this interview? That just was this with Paul Perry or this was something was else? Paul this Perry. is Paul exactly. Perry because I know they work and Paul's a great documentarian and they work together. But just, online, it's a it's a great interview talking about shared death experience. But it was talking yeah. about the new book he was going to be writing too, because he wrote a book about shared death experiences wow. um, called. I would have to find it because I have it in my. Yeah, book. no, he's an amazing guy. But you know, I I'm wondering for you, you know, and this is a big concept on my channel that I've emphasized so far which is kind of like people ask like what is spiritual and that's a big question and like you i was like watching a documentary in the shift channel with dr wayne dyer and someone kind of asked him what it means to be spiritual or something, something like that and he just answered he goes like kind of like be enthusiastic what do you mean like like have a party be happy what is enthu but the word enthusiastic comes from a greek word in theos which means the inner god within and the inner joy within and kind of doing what you love, and that's the most spiritual thing. So I emphasize in my channel that, you know, you could do chants, you could burn incense, all those things are great, but really, you know, the, a lot of that is tools, and it's really about the life itself that enriches the experience. In other words, to live while we live. You're someone who I know personally seems to travel a lot, experience a lot. Put aside, like, this other stuff, like, what are some things that, like, that get you going or keep you enthusiastic and what do you practice to kind of get you up yeah well i must say that i'm very fortunate because i have two other children so i have four children children and right. two in spirit and then i have my two daughters and one of them just got married last weekend so that wow. that is um really exciting and fun to and my other daughter actually um was the one who uh, did the ceremony for her. So she's the one who, um, and, and it was beautiful. It was such a nice ceremony. So I think that um, it really is important. I, I do travel a lot. I used to travel a lot before COVID. Um, my husband's from France and then his offices are in Asia. So we used to always kind of be in between. Um, but I think that being able to reach a hand back and help others is the most important part of this journey. And even if a parent isn't yet completely healed, I think that by reaching that hand back and giving that person whatever knowledge or whatever you've already gleaned along the journey is so important because it, helps us the person who is trying to heal the other person mm -hmm. even more than it does the person who is getting help and that's a huge part of helping parents heal is that we have lots and lots of parents who spend many hours of their day on mm -hmm. the phone or having coffee or other things with parents wow. to help them move forward on their journey as well wow it's really like it's like a concept kind of like ubuntu right if you're familiar with it it's like a person is a person through a person and just getting back to that community and how we are our brothers and sisters keeper you know really here to take care of one another and someone else's loss is not outside of ourselves that there's an interconnectivity of things 
correct me if I'm wrong, was Morgan a sports guy? I know you mentioned he was six six, but what is was he a sports guy too? Like you would think maybe he was, but yes, like he, foot he must have been a football guy with that he build. Was football player in high school. He was also track and field and he actually got the Marine scholarship at the end of um it's given to one boy and one girl who are the best in like the teams nominate okay. them. Not necessarily the best athletes, but the ones who he, he would train the other athletes as well. And actually in China, he was um, teaching basketball to high schoolers. Wow. He was working with deaf mute children um, who were in high school as well. Um, and it was really amazing because we took a vacation to Hong Kong and then to Bali mm -hmm. right after he transitioned. And we were at a club med. We mm -hmm. were in we were in a um, yoga room. We were about to do yoga. And this Chinese girl who was there um, said, uh, you look like Morgan Boisson. Do you know Morgan Boisson? And we wow. said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Nanjing. And we said, it's our son. And we were so amazed. I mean, what are the chances in Bali to, in a yoga studio, to find this girl who knew Morgan? And yeah. she was talking about how he had positively influenced so many kids in China. And um, I know that he volunteered, but he was also a cheerleader in um, at U of A. And wow. so I kind of feel like he, the, the football skills that he learned in high school because he got these huge shoulders and could lift a girl on one arm. He was, a, he was a literal mountain of a man. And it's just, you know, allegorical for the whole kind of thing with the mountains and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for the mountains. But also just he, I feel like he's the head cheerleader of all the cheerleaders of our kids. He's wow. kind of the, the one that's has the bullhorn and he's... That's, well, yeah, I, I saw there was like... Uh, a news station that came and that was like this cheerleading thing. Yeah, I know. But I was going for a run this morning and I never talk about, I'm a sports enthusiastic guy, but I, I just felt like Morgan wanted me to bring up like a sports reference. I don't know. Like I'm not a medium. I've never been trained, but he kept on wanting me to talk about Magic Johnson. And when I think oh. of Magic Johnson, I think of a visionary and how you're able to see things a couple steps ahead but then I kept on also seeing Michael Jordan too, which to me personifies like, like you have to like find the inner dog in you. Give me the ball. Let me have the shot. I want it. Came on the line. I want to create. And so for you, like that's the way that I see leaders. They are visionaries. They see things a couple steps ahead and they understand the value of empowering others, how their success is only as good as people around them success. But to initiate that, yeah, you want to, this is like my opportunity, not having someone else to take that shot. We have to do this. I have to initiate that. So yes, we could learn a lot from sports, you know, into our own personal life like Morgan did. But for those parents who have lost a loved one and are just wanting to maybe be ambassadors of change or to want to influence change, like what kind of like insight would you give? Because that's a very hard thing to do where all of a sudden you're filled with this and you're someone who has done it you lived it like how could we have other elizabeth Boisson, like and it's impossible to replicate you in many ways but like how could people learn from your example and be leaders in their own communities like what have you tapped into well i think the only thing that i've tapped into is love i mean i just i basically they think that these kids are leading in love and and I feel very grateful for that. I have to go back to Michael Jordan just quickly because right. Morgan's favorite movie was Space Jam. And I went to school with Michael Jordan at UNC. I, oh my there say no more. There you go. <laughs> and he yeah. was exactly the same years that I was. And um he um really was a huge role model for Morgan. And um before he passed, he had he had a recording of "I Believe I Can Fly" right. on his um, on his phone before R. Kelly was controversial. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, the whole thing, but yeah, it's such a beautiful song, though. It's really sad. So it's so frustrating. Yeah. Um. So anyway, um, that 
idea of Morgan and Magic Johnson was one of his favorites too. But I think that that um, may make sense that maybe Morgan brought that through to you. And then um, going uh, going forward in terms of um, if if parents are interested in being able to do the same kind of thing and help parents. We have so many openings all over the world. Um, right now, Helping Parents Heal is in the United States. It's in Canada and in Mexico and in Brazil, and then in the UK and in South Africa. And we have groups in India and in New Zealand and wow. Australia. So um, those are the places that we have groups um but certainly we can expand the groups that we have there but we would love to expand into other areas of the country and the world so if people are interested we're always looking for affiliate leaders of groups we're also looking for caring listeners although right now we have plenty of caring listeners we have caring listeners in all different times and they speak nine different languages, not each one, but we have a caring listener who speaks um, Mandarin Chinese. We have a caring listener who speaks French. We have, wow. a, so we have different languages that are spoken by our caring listeners as well to be able to help. But if people are interested in doing any of those, you know, either of those two uh, things, it would be wonderful. Um, and Again, you get so much more mm -hmm. from being able to help others than um, than you ever re would realize. And you see, like how much potential people have when they're, you know, just giving and putting that example. It's communities. You know, the world itself could be changed by just us being able to take that step and walking through faith. And so, for other like affiliate. I know we've spoken about like other affiliates of helping parents heal, like people who are going through loss and stuff like that. Is there a way for people to find, you know, other different resources or, you know, getting involved? Like what would be the best way to do, to go about that? Well, I think that one thing that is um, a good way to kind of find out what helping parents heal is about right. is to first watch the documentary. It's 17 shining light parents who were oh. interviewed like, Craig McMahon, and they talk about their children in spirit. And that documentary became the book Life to Afterlife, uh, Helping Parents Heal the Book. So it has chapters from each of the people who were in that documentary. Uh, the documentary, which is called Life to Afterlife, Mom, Can You Hear Me, is available for free on YouTube. It was available on Amazon prime for free in the beginning but now you have to pay on amazon prime um but then we also have um other resources um for for parents there are 500 youtube videos that are housed on our website and you obviously have come to speak to us maybe three times and we're so grateful to you as well as other afterlife experts, parents who speak about books that they've written or maybe foundations that they've created. We have grief experts as well, such as David Kessler, who spoke at our conference. We also have um, guided meditations, sound meditations, all different kinds of um, meditations to be able to, um, to move forward and heal but also gallery readings. We have lots and lots of gallery readings with different mm -hmm. um, mediums who have been certified for helping parents heal and who help us free of charge. Yeah. And, um, and so all of these resources are free of charge as well. And we would love to have anyone who wants to um, take advantage of them. You do it all. And I know that airy side of you is always call to action and always kind of thinking of the next thing i'm wondering with helping parents heal like what's like the next like maybe event or vision that you have brewing because i know there's always something going around with you guys like what is that kind of thing happening yeah 
Well, we have a conference coming up. So we've had two conferences so far. We had one in Paradise Valley in uh, Arizona, and we had 500 parents there, and I think we had 25 speakers. Then we had COVID come, and we were supposed to have one in Charleston, South Carolina. That wasn't possible. We had to cancel that one. Um, but in 2022, we had a conference that um, that had 900 parents and 44 speakers, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have another one of those um, in 2024 wow. with Googleitis, who is our fearless conference director, and um, we plan to welcome a thousand parents to that one, and um, we'll probably have the same number of speakers because we don't have more time in term terms of speaking. But we're really looking forward to it, and we're getting excited about it. So, to our listeners, put that on your calendar. Time goes fast; you do not want to miss an event with Helping Parents Heal. Uh, Elizabeth, it's been just a pleasure and honor you know, having you on here. How could people get in touch with you? Are you on social media, stuff like that? You know, how could people like follow you guys? Like what's the best way, you know, to stay current with you guys? I think the best way is by going on um, Instagram because our link tree is in our bio. So it has links to everything that we do. Mm. We do have a website, which is www.helpingparentsheal.org. Um, that has tons of resources. But we also have uh, an Instagram account. We have many, many Facebook accounts. We have um, a Twitter account as well. Um, we have a documentary. We have our, mm. our book. And our yeah. book is given away every three months for free on wow. Kindle. If you're on Helping Parents Heal, um, I always make an announcement that it's free of charge to download. So we've given away thousands of the book for free and any books that are sold, all of the proceeds go to Helping Parents Heal as well. Oh my God. Well, it's amazing. And I've read the book and I just love, you know, the different chapters from all the shining light parents. And it just, sometimes the book has an energy to it. And this definitely has an intentional energy that's just so uplifting and yes you know elizabeth get in touch with her i hope that we could see each other because arizona is like a second home to me i have so much family in the tucson area so we're, we're going to make that happen um we've covered a lot and you've dropped endless gem after gem you know for listeners i'm wondering if there's any last messages or anything that you know maybe we didn't get into uh, well love to have you back on you know, whenever you can, but is there anything else that you would like to share or just tell the audience? Yeah. I think that one of the most important things for people to understand is that this journey, this grief journey gets easier and softer. And that, um, again, our kids are with us every step of the way. And I, I do believe that um, in the beginning, a lot of parents think that their kids want them to be sad they they don't want us to be sad none of our loved ones in spirit they are so happy they are so elevated in, in everything that they do so it's it's important to realize that if you maybe find groups around you where they're talking about ways to move forward and heal um those are the groups that you want to be a part of because you will heal. You will be able to heal. I have healed. Um, many of our Shining Light parents have healed as well. And it is something, again, that our loved ones in spirit want us to do. And we can do so much more when we're healed, too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Elizabeth Boisson, just an incredible beacon of light who continues to not have the story define her, but she defines this incredible story. And we're so lucky to be on fortune of this beautiful story that you're continuously writing in such a loving, high vibratory way and brings us all together and helps us all heal. So thank you for all you do. Listeners, please check out Elizabeth Bassan and Helping Parents Heal. Please spread the good word. 
and thank you for tuning in. Please make sure you also check out HPH Helping Parents Heal on YouTube. They have incredible videos um, that you could check out. And please make sure to subscribe to her channel as well. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your generous time and being our guest. We will connect again. You know, and thank you for inspiring me as always. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. This has been wonderful. Thank you.